Today, in the last of these short talks, we come to the story of the wise men in Matthew chapter 2. Wise men note, not kings, and Matthew doesn't say how many there were. In verse 1, he calls them magi. In ancient writings going back to the 6th century BC, this word refers to the priests of Zoroastrianism, the ancient religion of Persia. Mystics who practiced divination and other ancient occult arts, who studied the stars and planets to interpret and predict important events. The Magi in Matthew saw a star in the east or at its rising, and inferred from it that a king of the Jews was born. Several different suggestions have been made as to what the star might have been, some more plausible than others, but the fact is that we really don't know what it was. The Magi came to Jerusalem in the days of Herod the king. I mentioned in an earlier talk that Herod died in the year 4 BC. We know this from writers such as Josephus and from coins and inscriptions and so on. So how come Jesus was not born in AD 1, as we would expect? The answer is that at the time, nobody was counting years BC and AD. It wasn't till the 5th century that it was decided to date years from the birth of Christ. Because it was so long after the event that they worked it out, the calculation was a few years out. Carol readings usually end at verse 12, with the wise men returning to their own country by another route to bypass Jerusalem and King Herod. This avoids the disturbing story of what happens next. But I think Matthew would be horrified if he knew what we were doing. I think he would tell us that, in fact, we had missed the whole point by stopping at verse 12. The main plot line is that through the visit of the wise men, Herod learns of the birth of one who poses a threat to his power. And as a result, he seeks to destroy him. And so Jesus is taken away to Egypt until it is safe for him to return to the land of Israel. As we shall see, this is a kind of reenactment of the story of the Exodus from Egypt. In chapter one, we saw how Joseph received a crucial message through an angel who appeared to him in a dream. After the wise men leave the scene in chapter two, he receives two more angelic messages through appearances in dreams. First, in verse 13, he is warned to flee to Egypt to escape the murderous intentions of Herod. Later, he is told in verse 19 that it is now safe to return because Herod has died. Meanwhile, in between, Herod, realising the wise men had outwitted him, ordered the massacre of all baby boys up to the age of two in Bethlehem and its vicinity an atrocity that is commemorated in the church calendar as the massacre of the holy innocents. An evil king who orders the large-scale murder of male children and a special child who escapes. It clearly echoes the story of the birth of Moses. The story of Moses' birth is told in Exodus chapters 1 and 2. Pharaoh alarmed at the rapid population growth of his Hebrew slaves, feared an uprising and ordered the death of all baby boys. They were to be thrown into the Nile. Moses was saved by the action of his parents, like Jesus. In Moses' case, they hid him in a basket in the river Nile. At the time that Matthew wrote his gospel, Jewish tradition had expanded the story of Moses to include a warning to Pharaoh that a child was about to be born who would be a threat to his power and a warning through a dream of danger to Moses' parents. 
Moreover, the words of the angel to Joseph in verse 20, that those who were seeking the life of the child have died, repeats almost exactly what was said to the adult Moses in Exodus 4, 19, after he had escaped death again at the hands of Pharaoh. In this, and in other ways later in his Gospel, Matthew portrays Jesus as a second Moses, one who was born to deliver Israel and lead them out of captivity into a right covenant relationship with God. In connection with this theme, Matthew's portrayal of Joseph has parallels with the Old Testament Joseph, the son of Jacob. Both that Joseph and this one received revelations through dreams. And both of them went down to Egypt and brought their families with them in order to save them. In Genesis, God used Joseph to take his brothers and their wives and children, the nucleus of the people of Israel, to safety in Egypt. Now in Matthew, he uses another Joseph to take Israel's Messiah to safety in the same place. The Magi themselves recall another Old Testament story from the beginning of Israel's history, one that is told in Numbers chapters 22 to 24. Travelling through the wilderness on their way to the Promised Land, the people encountered another wicked king who tried to destroy them, this time by employing the occult arts of another magus type of pagan mystic called Balaam. Like Matthew's Magi, Balaam was also described as coming from the east, and like them he also saw a star that signified a king of Israel. Balaam found that he was unable to call down a curse upon the Israelites, but instead he blessed them and prophesied, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. A ruler will come out of Jacob. In Jewish interpretation, this was taken to refer first to the rise of King David four centuries later, but also to the coming of Messiah, the son of David. Just as Balaam had seen the rising of the star of David, so now the Magi saw the star of one born to be king of the Jews, David's descendant and heir. Three times Matthew quotes from the prophets of the Old Testament, from Micah, Hosea and Jeremiah. Like Isaiah, who was cited at the end of chapter 1 and will be again at the beginning of chapter 3, they were all prophets of Israel's exile and subsequent return to the Promised Land. As we saw earlier, Matthew is dropping a massive hint that the end of estrangement from God and restoration to a right relationship with him has come at last. So in verses 3 to 6, Herod consults the chief priests and the scribes to find out where the Messiah was to be born. And they reply by quoting from Micah chapter 5 verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. In its context, this prophesy goes on to describe the victory that this ruler will win over Israel's enemies and the ending of war and reign of peace that he will secure as a result. In verse 15, Joseph's flight, taking Mary and Jesus to safety in Egypt, is said to fulfil Hosea 11.1. 1. Out of Egypt 
I called my son. A passage where God recalls the Exodus when he brought his people out of captivity, but reflects sorrowfully that ever since then they have been continually unfaithful to him, in spite of his love and kindness to them. Now he will send them to exile in Assyria, metaphorically back to Egypt. Yet because of his love for them, he will not leave them there, but will call them out again and restore them. Jesus going to Egypt and returning again symbolises the fulfilment of this. Again in verse 17, we read that the massacre of the innocents took place to fulfil Jeremiah 31 verse 15. A voice is heard in Rama, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Exactly why the wholesale slaughter of innocent children should be part of God's plan is way beyond our ability to understand. But at least we can say that such terrible suffering is not completely without meaning or purpose and that God does know and does care about it. Again, in its original context, Jeremiah's prophecy is about the suffering of Israel's coming exile. But this chapter of Jeremiah goes on to say, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Although there is weeping and mourning now in Bethlehem, the one who will establish this new covenant, this new relationship with God, has been born. In all this we see again how the Old Testament provides the background to the story of Jesus. His birth and all that he goes on to teach and do, especially his death and resurrection from the dead, are the fulfilment of Old Testament promises, expectations and hopes. The realisation of God's will and purposes for his people and for the world. The dawn of a new day, which will see God's kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Somebody said wise men worshipped Jesus. Wise men still do. Who else can bring us the forgiveness of sins and bring our estrangement from God to an end? Who else can make God known to us, not only as our God, but as our Father in heaven? Who else can bring us at last, safely through death, into the promised land of his Father's house, where there will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. To him be all glory and honour and power, and to you be his peace and joy and goodwill, now and evermore. Amen. <laughs>